I'm sure that a lot of you out there can remember being kids and going to the store with your parents and really wanting something. And that might have been a candy bar or a video game or a t-shirt. And I'm not sure how your parents responded to you, but my mother, who's out there somewhere today, hi, Mom, hi, Mom, <laughs> she, when I asked her for something that she didn't want to give, would sort of cock her head to the side and say, yeah, well, people in hell want ice water. <laughs> Now, sidestepping the fact that my suburban Maryland childhood was being compared to one of Dante's circles, this was also completely out of line with the somewhat demanding, always determined to get what she wants and feel she deserves woman that I knew. Nothing illustrates that more than our time at drive through windows. My mother would pick me and my older brother Ryan up from Burger King, or excuse me, up from daycare, and we would head to Burger King. And before we'd even placed our order, they would already be at strike one because the line was too long and it was moving too slowly. We'd get to the second window and we would be charged for french fries that we didn't order, and that was strike two. Now, at this point, me and my brother are looking at each other in the back seat, hoping and praying that the somewhat demanding, always determined to get what she wants and feel she deserves woman that we knew didn't reveal herself at the next window. <laughs> Many times in my childhood, this prayer went unanswered. <laughs> we would get to the third window, and like clockwork, I would be given a Coke instead of a Sprite. Now, I'm sitting in the back seat, trying to reason with her, saying, it's okay, I can drink the Coke, because quite frankly, I was eight years old. I just wanted a sugary drink anyway. But she would ignore my protests from the back seat. She would cock her head to the side and look out of her car window and say, you know what? I want to speak to the manager. And she would proceed to tell the manager not just what was wrong with this specific visit to Burger King, but what was wrong three weeks ago and how maybe this was indicative of a larger problem. <laughs> and how she felt she deserved to be treated as a customer at this establishment. As I grew up and out of being an embarrassed eight-year-old, this became one of the things I most admired about my mother. But needless to say, this was in direct contradiction with this idea that I can't have things that I want because people in hell want ice water. <laughs> Let's think about what that statement really means. There are two parts. One, there are people out there somewhere, presumably in hell, who desperately want something that they are never going to have access to. The unspoken extension is, why should you have what you want? What makes me so special? The second part of that revolves around this idea of being grateful. And it's a reassurance that, actually, you're not in hell. You're just in Virginia in the middle of August, and yeah, it's hot. <laughs> But it could be so much worse. In fact, it could be so much worse that you should be grateful. And that even when I can see better, when I can reach better, I shouldn't ask for it because people in hell want ice water. That leads me to the question that I want to ask you. When is it hot enough? When is something bad enough? When is wrong wrong enough for you to not just know that somebody somewhere should say something, but for you to be the one who speaks up? I had to answer this question for myself during my second year at the University of Virginia. That year, I was the political action chair of the Black Student Alliance, and if you recall, from July to August of 2014, a black man was killed by law enforcement agents every week, culminating in the death of Michael Brown in Missouri. Needless to say, by the time we got back to grounds at the end of August, Black Lives Matter and eliminating police brutality were my main focus as political action chair. And if there was a movement, then we were in it. We had rallies on the lawn, we marched through libraries, we had a die-in on President Sullivan's steps. But still, there was an undeniable feeling of distance between What, was, what this larger problem was and where we were. You see, police brutality was something that happened in New York and something that happened in Cleveland and something that happened in Ferguson. It didn't happen here. But stand in solidarity, we did, and before I knew it, it was March. Now, at UVA on St. Patrick's Day, students go out. <laughs> the restaurants have discounts and the bars have drink deals, and kids congregate on the corner to partake in the festivities. That St. Patrick's Day, a friend of mine asked whether or not I would be going out, too. I told him that I wouldn't, that I had some work to complete, but that he should have enough fun for the both of us. The next morning, I woke up, and the first thing I did was check my phone. I opened the group message of the Black Student Alliance, and the image that hit me was one of a black boy's busted head and bloodstained shirt. I squinted at his shirt, at his chest first, 
to make sure that the blood on his shirt was not indicative of a more deadly wound. Then I squinted at his face, because surely this couldn't be the boy who I'd seen not 12 hours before and told to have enough fun for the both of us. But it was Martise Johnson, and I would soon find out that his body was pinned to the red cobblestone and his ankles and wrists shackled over suspicion of a fake ID. Myself, Joy, the then VSA president, and VJ, the president of the NAACP at UVA at the time, got together and we knew that we had to do something. We decided that we would have a dialogue talking about, yes, what had happened to Martise, but also the larger problem that was facing our nation. We booked Clark Hall, which should sit about 200 people. And as soon as we got there, about 20 minutes before the event was set to begin, we saw a line snaking out of the door and mobs of people still descending in that direction. And we knew it wouldn't be big enough. So someone made a phone call to a university administrator and we booked Newcomb Ballroom within minutes. Newcomb Ballroom fits 400. And still, as we got there and watched people pile in, we knew that this space wouldn't be large enough either. This must have been apparent to the crowd as well, because without myself or VJ or Joy telling anyone to do anything, they began to move of their own accord towards the outdoor amphitheater. At this point, me and VJ are running, just trying to catch up to this crowd that we're supposed to be leading. And we realize three things. We have no microphones, no speakers, and nothing to say. Still, we get to the amphitheater and we're standing on the grassy area in front of it. And after the only part of our originally planned program has finished, the reading of an excerpt from James Baldwin's letter to my nephew, no one wants to take this megaphone that someone graciously gave us. Joy says, you and VJ are the ones who like to do this public speaking thing. One of you should speak. VJ holds the megaphone like his hands are on fire. And he says, you guys know that I pre-write all of my speeches. <laughs> Aaron's the one who likes to talk off the top of her head. And so they hand the megaphone to me. And I know that I don't know what to say. But as I look out at this crowd of a thousand people standing in front of me, I realize something. That they don't really know what they came to hear. They just know that something went wrong and that they want to be a part of the solution. I knew that for my mother, the difference between a Coke and a Sprite was reason enough to always say something. And so surely I could do so about my friend's busted head. So I spoke. I apologized that we'd had to change locations three times, but that we'd been talking about police brutality since August, and never before had we had a crowd that was more than two or 300 people. I talked about how Yes, there were a lot of unfamiliar faces in that crowd of all colors, but that it didn't matter if you had come to events like this before, what mattered was that they were there now and that they kept coming back. I talked about how when they did come back, yes, we should talk about Martise because what happened to him was undeniably horrible, but we should also talk about the society that we lived in that was bigger than Martise and bigger than UVA and bigger than Charlottesville and bigger than Virginia. It was nationwide and we needed to dissect why it was that so many charged to protect and serve hurt their citizens. In the coming days, we would hear a lot about how Martise was lucky to have lived and how we should be grateful that it wasn't worse. And of course, we were grateful. But we didn't want to spend our time listing off all of the reasons that we weren't in hell, trying to justify injustice. Instead, we wanted to figure out how we could get to heaven. So we wrote Towards a Better University, a 26-page document that outlines recommendations for how to create a more racially harmonious UVA and Charlottesville community. In the year and a half since its publication, we have seen increased black faculty, the introduction of directors of diversity in each school and each department. We've seen the introduction of an engaging difference component to the curriculum. We've seen pamphlets given to citizens about how they can know their rights when dealing with police officers. So that's how I came to answer this question of when is wrong, wrong enough? Thanks, Mom, for inadvertently teaching me to be a little bit less grateful. <laughs> and, to, and to everybody here, if life is a metaphorical Burger King, then just know that a little bit of wrong is always wrong enough to go ahead and ask for the manager. Thank you. <laughs>